Hello, and welcome to the Metro Vision Idea Exchange, Local and Regional Strategies to Achieve Vision Zero. My name is Kate Hale, and I'm an assistant planner here at the Denver Regional Council of Governments, or Dr. Cog. I'm joined today by Jill Locantore from Denver Streets Partnership, Rolf Isinger from the City of Denver, and Beth Dolibo from Dr. Cog, who will be discussing strategies to incorporate the Vision Zero philosophy into regional, local, and advocacy planning. Here is our agenda for today. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted to the Dr. Cog website. There will be a brief survey that appears upon exiting the webinar. Please consider taking a moment to respond to that. I have a very short set of announcements and housekeeping items to run through before I turn the mic over to our speakers. All in-person Bike to Work Day activities have been canceled based on public health guidelines, but we encourage you to participate in a Bike to Wherever week. Whether you're headed to the workplace, the park, or just to get a workout in, you can still pledge to choose biking the week of September 21st. Visit biketoworkday.us to pledge and to order your gear. With the generous support of APA Colorado, one AICP credit is in the approval process for attendees listening to this session live only. We will send, you, send out the event number for this webinar when it has been approved through APA. By now, I'm sure you're all quite comfortable with the various webinar tools, but as the interfaces do vary slightly, I want to direct your attention to the location of the audio settings within the GoToWebinar control panel. If you are experiencing audio issues, you can let us know in the chat box and Annie on our team will be available to help troubleshoot. We will accept questions through the questions pane in the control panel. Please submit, submit questions at any time during the event and we will address them during the Q&A portion at the end. We wanted to kick off with a few interactive polls to get an idea of who is in the room today. So I'm going to go ahead and launch the first one now. Hopefully you see um, the question with the answer options up on your screen. The question is, uh, how familiar, familiar are you with Vision Zero? I see some responses rolling in, so that's a good sign. I'll give you about a uh, few more seconds to respond to that. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll now. Looks like the majority of you are very familiar, so that's, that's good. And then we um, have a few here that are not very familiar. So um, that's good to know where we're all at. I will now share the second poll question. Does your community have a Vision Zero plan in place? Um, you can answer just whichever those responses most accurately describes your community, um, nothing nothing of a Vision Zero plan or some sort, some form of safety plan that's not specifically Vision Zero. Are you in the process of de developing a Vision Zero plan? Um, do you have a Vision Zero plan in place? And then if you're not sure, that is an option as well. I'm gonna go ahead and close that now. There's quite a few of you that do not have a Vision Zero plan in place, um, so I guess that's why we're here today. And one more question. Is zero the right goal? Glad to see that was uh, 
it looks like an, an easy one and we're kicking this off on the right page. Okay, so now I just have um, a short video that will set the stage for our speakers. Um, I will launch that now. And if you are having any issues um, with the audio on this, just let us know in the chat, bo chat box and we'll share out the link to um, directly to the video. I would only be guessing maybe 1,500. A couple hundred? I don't know, say a thousand. Uh, probably over a few dozen, I'd have to say. Drunk driving. Alcohol related. Texting and driving. Road rage. I would say sadly not. No. Probably not. Uh, I'm hoping for that. Hundred, hundred and fifty. Uh, I think less than a hundred. So how could you quantify such a thing? No, I mean, nobody needs to die. There's no reason for it. Zero. Zero. Ah, uh, zero. Absolutely. <laughs> zero. Zero. Of course. Yeah. Zero. Uh, yeah, they should shoot for that. Absolutely. Ideally, yes. Yes, yes, definitely. Obviously, yeah, zero would be the best goal. All right, I will now introduce our first speaker. Jill Locantori brings 16 years of experience in urban and regional planning to her position as executive director for the Denver Streets Partnership. Throughout her planning career, Ms. Locantori has focused on the intersection of land use and transportation with environmental sustainability, economic development, public health, and social justice issues. With experience working within the public and nonprofit sectors, Ms. Locantore has built a reputation as an important advocate and spokesperson for human-centered transportation and its key role in building healthy communities. Jill was also previously a principal planner at Dr. Cog. Jill, I will hand it off to you. Thank you, Kate. Let's see if I have control of the presentation here. I do, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with the Denver Streets Partnership, we are a coalition of community organizations who are advocating for people-friendly streets here in Denver. Um, earlier this year, two of the founding members of the coalition, Walk Denver and Bicycle Colorado, actually merged um, to fully staff the Denver Streets Partnership as the city's first fully multimodal advocacy group advocating for walking, biking, transit, and safe streets. Um, so all of the work that we did previously in Denver as Walk Denver and Bicycle Colorado is now continuing under the Denver Streets Partnership brand um, and with the guidance of our coalition. On this slide you see members of our steering committee that include a wide variety of groups that are interested in transportation from a variety of perspectives including public health, social justice, environmental issues, access for people with disabilities, um, and planning for people throughout their lifespans. 
Vision Zero was uh, one of the main issues that brought our coalition together. Uh, this is us hosting a, a Vision Zero rally with Mayor Hancock, you can barely see him in the middle of the picture, um, back in 2016. And early on, we established core principles that define for us what Vision Zero means um, and has really guided our work as we've supported the city of Denver and Dr. Cog and the state in planning for Vision Zero and transportation safety. It's good to see in the early poll that uh, a lot of you uh, feel like you're very familiar with Vision Zero. So hopefully these core principles are familiar as well. Uh, but we think it's always helpful to reiterate because Vision Zero is so different from how we've approached traffic safety in the past. Um, and as we discussed in the poll and in that video, the, the really the foundational principle is that zero is the right number for traffic fatalities. This is really a shift in philosophy that's reflected in the language that we've used to talk about traffic safety. In the past, we tend to talk about traffic accidents as if they were acts of God, that we couldn't predict them or prevent them. Um, whereas Vision Zero posits that we do in fact know what causes traffic crashes to happen or result in a serious injury or fatality. And we do know strategies to prevent them. And so we have a moral responsibility to do what we can to prevent any fatality on our city streets. Our second principle also should seem pretty obvious when you say it out loud that human life and well being should be the most important consideration when we're planning and designing and managing our transportation system. But again, this is a shift where historically we've been willing to make a calculation of how many lives we're willing to sacrifice in traffic crashes each year for the sake of you know, enabling the speed and convenience of driving. This is actually a mural that I really love from the city of Brooklyn with Lady Justice holding a scales with a car on, on one scale and people who've been killed in traffic crashes on the other scale. We also believe that everybody deserves to be safe on our city streets. Streets account for about 80% of the public space in our cities. Um, and whether you're walking, biking, taking transit, whether you're eight years old or you're 80 years old, we all should have access to that space and feel safe there. Um, and the discussions that we've all been having about racial justice too has really shown a spotlight on how we need to think holistically and inclusively about what it means to be safe on our streets. Um, this isn't just about traffic violence, but all the different forms of violence that people might encounter on our streets. We also believe that ultimately government is responsible for safe street design. Traditionally, traffic safety has focused a lot of attention on individual responsibility, uh, but there's really a limit on what individuals can do when they're confronted with a system that's unsafe by design. Um, for example, if you're a person in a wheelchair who requires a mobility assistance device and you're in one of Denver neighborhoods, the 40% of streets that don't have sidewalks or sidewalks that aren't ADA accessible, what is your responsibility in that instance to protect your own safety? Are you supposed to stay home? Um, or is it the responsibility of the government to provide safe ways for you to access and get around the community? Another really important principle is this idea that people are always going to make mistakes, um, but those mistakes don't have to be fatal on our city streets. Um, fundamentally, humans are fallible, we get distracted, we exercise poor judgment, we suffer health issues that impact our behavior when we're on our city streets. Um, and if we're pinning our hopes on somehow perfecting human beings, and that's how we're going to get to zero fatalities, that's setting ourselves up for failure. Um, so instead, Vision Zero says we should anticipate human mistakes and design our streets to be forgiving so those mistakes don't result in a tragedy. Um, I like to tell this story of this one specific traffic crash as an example of how this principle plays out. Um, Christian McDonald was a victim of a traffic crash that happened in January of 2017. It was in the wee hours of the morning, about 2 a.m. on a Sunday night in downtown Denver. Um, and Christian was standing in the middle of the street on Blake Street downtown and just watching the cars coming towards him. It's hard to know what was going on in Christian's mind. We do know he had a history of mental illness, so he may have been disoriented, didn't know where he was. Um, he may have been feeling suicidal. Um, we will never know because a car hit him 
threw him to the side of the road and continued without even stopping to check on him. And unfortunately, he passed away. So you may look at a situation like this and wonder, what could we possibly do to prevent this type of tragedy? Do we have to solve mental illness in order to make our safe streets? Um, but if you look at the details a little bit more, we do know that one of the biggest factors that determines whether a crash happens and whether it's fatal is how fast the driver is going. And we know in this case, the driver was going well above the posted speed limit of 25 miles per hour in downtown Denver. Um, and we also know that the biggest determinant of how fast people are driving is the design of the roadway. Blake, where the crash happened, is a three-lane, one-way street that's designed to get traffic as fast as possible out of downtown Denver, um, whereas if you could compare it just one block over to Wazee Street, it's a two-lane, much narrower street, two directions, it's got more on-street parking, people just naturally go much slower. Um, so if the crash had happened on Wazee, it's likely the car would have been going slower. Maybe the driver would have seen Christian and been able to stop before hitting him or maybe not been driving as fast when the crash occurred. And so Christian may have walked away rather than dying from the result of that crash. This relates to the larger principle that more generally, we know that the biggest factor and that determines how people behave on the street, whether they're safe or engaging in dangerous behaviors is the design of the street itself. Um, and so in order to get to zero fatalities, we need to take a fresh look at systems that have been frankly designed to encourage risky behavior like speeding. Um, on major arterials, this means providing clear, safe, and separated spaces for people using different modes of travel. So nice, wide, buffered sidewalks, protected bike lanes, dedicated spaces for people using transit. Um, and this is exactly what the city is planning for corridors like Colfax Avenue with their plans for bus rapid transit. Not only is that project going to significantly increase the quality of transit on that corridor, but it's also gonna make it safer for everybody. Um, and on slower, more neighborhood streets, the, the key is really reinforcing very slow speeds that allow cars and people walking and biking to in intermingle together safely. Um, this has been done for quite a while in Europe. This is an example for Copenhagen of a shared street design where cars are allowed, um, but you can see bikes and pedestrians are really prioritized and the streets designed to reinforce slow speeds. We also believe that enforcement can't correct for street designs that are just fundamentally dangerous. We often tend to wag our finger at, at people for crossing where there's not a crosswalk. Um, but if you look at the bigger picture, you might see that there isn't in fact a safe crosswalk any, anywhere near the place where people were trying to cross the street. Um, and so instead of punishing people for dealing with an inadequate transportation system, it's best to actually provide the safe infrastructure that people need to get where they're going quickly and efficiently. Um, and again, the recent discussion about uh, social justice has further underlined the hazards of relying on officer-initiated enforcement and you know, increasing police interactions with the community as a way of enforcing traffic safety that can have unintended consequences, consequences exacerbating existing tensions and injustices in that community. Vision Zero is also very data-driven and focuses attention on those streets and behaviors that we know are the most likely to re result in a serious crash. Um, both the city of Denver and Dr. Cog have mapped out what they call a high injury network where there's considerably more serious crashes than other streets. These are typically arterial roadways, streets like Colfax, Colorado Boulevard, Federal Boulevard. Um, and it's not that people suddenly become reckless or uh, careless about their behaviors when they arrive at these streets. There's something inherently about the design of the streets that make serious crashes more likely to happen. We also believe that people driving um, have a critical responsibility when it, it comes to traffic safety. If I'm walking and I'm distracted by my cell phone and I bump into one of our co-speakers, Beth or, or Rolf, I'm not likely to seriously injure either one of them. But if I'm behind the wheel of a car, I'm piloting a, you know, several thousand pounds of steel that can inflict great deal of damage on other people. So we have a special responsibility to be mindful of how our behavior affects others. 
And then our final uh, principle is that we, if we can truly achieve vision zero and make our streets safe for everyone, not just cars, but people outside of cars, that that will enhance the overall quality of life of our community, supporting the health and well-being of our residents and really supporting thriving commercial districts. So these are the core principles that have really informed our advocacy work with the city and county of Denver and our engagement um, with the community. Um, and before I hand off to our next speaker, Rolf, I wanted to show a quick video um, about some work that we did in partnership with the city of Denver to engage the community in Vision Zero and illustrate what safer street designs look like. Um, Kate, can you pull up that video for us? I sure can. Vision Zero is a strategy that cities are employing right now to make the community aware, but also create metrics around traffic deaths and injuries. And the idea is to get to zero deaths and zero injuries. And we're just trying to create awareness around that. When we opened up the Vision Zero community program for communities to apply, uh, we wanted people to get creative about how they could improve traffic safety in their neighborhood. And a lot of people wanted to do tactical urbanism type demonstrations. The very first biggest improvement I'd like to see is to have crosswalks put in. There's some missing sidewalks, there are some substandard sidewalks, bike lanes don't all connect. We also could use some curb extensions. Medians to slow traffic down to create traffic friction points. A pedestrian signal. Anything to calm the drivers that are driving too fast and to make them pay more attention when they're driving through here as if it were a normal city street where people lived. So we've done a number of projects uh, all over the city in different neighborhoods. So I chose Tasty Colfax as the perfect opportunity to showcase pedestrian safety because about 500 people attend this event. And we have the problem of there's no way to cross the street. We have so many cars. And so choosing this event to showcase pedestrian safety was perfect for Vision Zero's grant. I'm here to re-educate the community, specifically traffic calming, to slow them down and to make them aware that children want to access this park. Montbello children have the highest numbers of childhood diabetes because of inactivity, and our seniors want to come out, but they don't feel safe outside walking. And we're here to take back our park from the cars. So we thought we should create an engaging event and art has been changing our cities. So we thought art would be a really good sort of social event to bring people to and then have that conversation. So kind of like having a party and then talking a little bit about like the heavier subject of Vision Zero. I have grown up in this community. I'm now raising my family in this community. And it's a great community, but I realized as I'm trying to get places, I couldn't fit my stroller on the sidewalk. And for us to cross was horrendously dangerous. And it makes getting from one part of our community to the other side of our community really hard. We're here today to demonstrate what this very dangerous street and intersection would feel like if there were some more thoughtful traffic controlling measures in place. I think that the city, the state need to focus more on it as a residential street. There are neighborhoods on either side of it where people live and it, that kind of idea gets forgotten. We have Boys and Girls Club, the Hope Center for Adults, um, the Hiawatha Davis Recreation Center, the Pauline Robinson Library. These are all amazing destinations for this neighborhood. And so we wanted to kind of help facilitate working with community to amplify their voices um, and work with the city of Denver to help improve public infrastructure in this neighborhood. 
The point of these demonstrations is all, one, to demonstrate safety and, and what a safer street could look like. Um, but the reason we partnered with the city on this program is to really get the word out there about Vision Zero. We really do want to spread awareness that this is an initiative that the city has committed to and we want to make sure that we are working on making our streets safer. This is a great example of something that you know kind of showcases what could possibly be done. The community is behind it, they're very supportive of it, which then helps the city uh, try to come on in and formalize this kind of improvement with maybe paint and post initially and kind of work out if there are any uh, tweaks that need to be made and then come on in later on and do more permanent installations. And so when you're doing traffic calming demonstration, um, you know, they're just ideas, but we really want to get people's feedback, get people's input, and hear people's stories about how do these things impact them, what would they like to see in their own neighborhood. And so hopefully this is a, a fun way to do that and a more creative way to do that. And um, we've gotten a lot of good feedback. We've also collected a lot of data. And we've noticed that, you know, cars do tend to slow down. People are curious, people are interested, and people always have a story about traffic safety in their neighborhood, and they want to share. We can, and when I say we, I'm talking about individuals, residents. You do have access to your city officials. You do have access to programs that can help uh, get the work done in your community. We need your voice so that we can bring the the decision makers and the problem solvers to your area. Okay, thank you, Jill. Um, Next up to speak, we welcome Rolf Isinger. Rolf manages Denver's, Denver's Vision Zero program within the Department of Transportation and Infrastructure. He has over 10 years of traffic safety experience along with his project management Lean Six Sigma and master level credentials. He has worked tirelessly because what other way is there as a public servant to improve and protect Denver's transportation system and the people who use it. Rolf, I will hand over the controls to you. All right, thank you. And uh, yeah, what an inspirational video. Uh, it's, uh, it's an excellent video. Thank you, Jill, for sharing that. And uh, good morning, almost good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the invite. I'm excited to share during the next about 10 minutes about how Denver created, has been implementing, and is currently evaluating our Vision Zero Action Plan. Let's see if this works. All right. Um, so, yeah, in order to complete, uh, actually, I just messed up my slides here. Okay, so back in 2016 is when Denver pledged Vision Zero, and that's when I was still um, a few states away in Louisville, Kentucky, managing their bike and ped program. But in 2017, Denver released their action plan, and it had an action item uh, to hire somebody to uh, manage the plan, and that's how I got involved which was in late 2018. So sometimes these things can take a little while, but I'd just like to remind folks that um, even though creating a whole program can sometimes take more time, uh, it doesn't mean that uh, quick safety projects and uh, programs can't start more quickly. All right, so just like Jill presented on, um, our action plan is also based on several key Vision Zero principles, and I won't go into these, um, but they are on your screen, um, but they mimic what Jill had just presented on, um, and these are uh, core to our, our plan. And when developing the action plan, we used a lot of crash data, such as traffic fatality data, uh, serious injury data, also commuting modes uh, to, to highlight vulnerable roadway users who are disproportionately being killed. So you can see how Denver commutes and then who is, uh, which mode is being most affected by traffic deaths. There we go. 
similar to what Jill had mentioned, um, you know, we also created a high entry network. It makes up about 5% of our roadways, but when the plan was created, it accounted for 50% of our traffic fatalities. Another layer that we looked at um, was social economic status data. And we developed this equity index layer. This really helps highlight exposure rates and oftentimes where there is historically a lack of traffic safety and investment. Um, so therefore, being able to understand um, where these different areas are helps us better understand where uh, additional traffic safety uh, projects should be invested in. Uh, oftentimes there may be a lack of sidewalk, lack of bike lanes, um, and when looking at some of the layers uh, in this data, such as um, populations without access to a vehicle, um, you know, uh, makes sense to have sidewalks or bike lanes, uh, ease of access to transit. Um, so definitely looking at this layer uh, is very helpful in, in our plan and helps us with our resource allocation. Uh, another critical input to the plan, um, and Jill was a big part of this as many, as well as maybe some of you on the call, uh, was the public engagement piece. Uh, and they collected over 2,700 comments uh, through this process, which is pretty strong. Um, so that's, that's another key element of this plan. Uh, but then the other uh, interesting element in this plan is, you know, after looking at the data, looking at the public involvement, this action plan really lives up to its name with 67 unique action items. Uh, and the strength of this plan is that it does have metrics. Um, and I just say that you may miss the mark on the timelines for when some of these uh, may be installed or maybe even the number, the quantities, but I think it's critical to have a goal, to have something to, to go after and, and, uh, and shoot for. Also, in order to complete the action items, definitely helps to develop an organizational structure and lean on those who help develop and provide input to the plan. Implementing this plan, implementing this plan really goes a long ways um, and well beyond uh, DOTI, but also includes other agencies as well. Also, keeping up with the 67 unique action items uh, isn't easy. But we've used our org chart to assign accountability, and we've developed a dashboard to help us keep up with the status by team member. Also, by tracking our progress, we're able to see where more resources are needed or and if metrics need to be updated. Like I said, you know, when you're coming up with metrics and timelines, um, do the best you can in putting out some of those uh, lofty goals. Uh, and you can always pivot and adjust as, as time goes on. And then I'd like to bring up, similar to what we saw in the video, you know, working with the community such as Jill, uh, Jill's group and the Denver Streets Partnership has really been helpful because they can help pilot these projects, which builds community support and awareness like they did on East Colfax. Uh, through through the Tasty Colfax event and the uh, Transportation Safety Pop-Up event. But then several months later, we came on in and installed uh, 14 similar safety improvements, and I believe there's one more yet to be installed um, along East Colfax, which is on our high injury network. And you can check out our website for more information about this project. I'd say that completing projects Actually, um, before I jump into completing projects, um, being transparent about your data is really helpful. Um, and you can go on our website and pull open our dashboard that has real time uh, crash data. So not only this dashboard shows the fatality data, but also the serious injury data is populated or it's updated every day. Um, and you, it's interactive, so you can toggle between just looking at um, certain times of day or years. You can compare historically uh, even the modes and you can see where the crashes are, are mapped. 
and that's been a very useful tool. But I'd say a lot of coordination with our police department and IT to make this happen. Um, thought I had one more, but um, I'd say that completing projects is hard enough, so thinking about evaluating them can be overwhelming, but it's, it's really critical to the Vision Zero program. Um, fatalities may go up citywide, but if we can show that where we're installing our projects is bringing down crashes, specifically the serious injury clashes and fatalities, we can say that Vision Zero is being achieved. Um, and for some reason, one of these slides isn't showing up, but let me just share with you a location at uh, 20th Street and I-25. Um, over the course of, I believe it was four years or so, there were 40 similar harmful events where a single vehicle were running into a, a, a barrier and it resulted in two fatalities and four serious injuries. Working with DPD, we learned that about 80% of the people involved in those crashes were not Denver residents. Uh, so with quite a bit of coordination with CDOT and the police department and DOTI, we made several safety improvements uh, which, you know, greater signage, striping, also additional um, DUI checkpoints, because we found that several folks, it seemed as though were leaving the bars and jumping on the interstate. They may not have lived in Denver and they weren't familiar with that, that corner of the area and they're going too fast and we're running into that barrier. But in 2019, um, we didn't have a single harmful event of a vehicle running into that barrier. We had zero serious injuries and we had zero traffic fatalities at that location in 2019. And so far uh, in 2020, that has been the case. But I hope this has been helpful and happy to answer any questions when that time comes. So uh, thank you. And I'm gonna hand it off to Beth. Thanks so much, Rolf. Um, uh, just a couple housekeeping items I want to um, remind people of before we move on to Beth. Um, I have a question about whether this presentation will be made available. Um, it is being recorded and it will be posted to the Dr. Cog website um, after the presentation. So you'll get a follow-up email tomorrow that will link to the location of the recorded website. Um, also, if you have any questions for Jill or Rolf um, or in general, please add them into the chat box and we will get to them during the Q&A portion. I'm going to hand over the presenter role to Beth now. Oh. Thank you, Caitlin. Hi, everyone. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm going to go through your introduction real quick, if you don't mind. I'm sorry. Um, Beth is a transportation planner at the Denver Regional Council of Governments. Um, at Dr. Cox, she is currently managing taking action on Regional Vision Zero and other safety related planning activities and analysis. She also manages Dr. Cog's active transportation planning work and is working to kick off a regional complete streets toolkits toolkit for Dr. Cog's member governments. Prior to Dr. Cog, she worked in North Carolina for the Wilmington Metropolitan Planning Organization, where she focused on bicycle and pedestrian planning. Thanks so much, Beth. Thanks, Caitlin. Hi, everyone. Again, I'm Beth Alibo. I'm a transportation planner for Dr. Cog staff and the project manager for taking action on Regional Vision Zero, um, which is a safety plan that was adopted by the Dr. Cog Board of Directors of, on um, June 16th of this year. Um, the plan establishes a target of zero serious injuries and fatalities on the Denver region's transportation system and provides direction on how the region can begin to achieve um, the target of zero. Um, so why the Denver region needs Vision Zero, I think it's fairly obvious. Um, in 2017, 260 people were killed on the Denver region's roadways. That was a 50% increase since 2013 and a large percent of these fatalities are involved of involving people walking and biking or on a motorcycle. Um, only 5% of all crashes involve these modes, but approximately 44% of fatal crashes 
involve these modes of travels and these stats are really similar similar um, to what Rolf just presented for the city of Denver. So these are modes that we really need to um, focus in on. Um, this map is included in the plan and shows small dots for people killed and, and seriously injured in the Denver region during years 2013 through 2017. 1,149 people died and 8,827 people were seriously injured. So that's almost 10,000 people affected by KSI crashes in just five years. Um, this, um, there was extensive public outreach done for taking action on Regional Vision Zero. Um, Dr. Cog kicked the project off with the video that was um, shown at the beginning of Jill's presentation. We also distributed an interactive public comment map and public survey along with the video. Um, the public identified over a thousand locations on the interactive map and Dr. Cog received over 3,300 survey submissions. Um, this map shows heat spots of public comments overlapping with the crash data driven regional hydro network um, that I'll explain in an upcoming slide. Um, as you can see, locations the public identified are pretty consistent with the data driven areas and overlap with the high injury network in a lot of locations, just kind of verifying that these are priority areas. Um, during the public comment period, Dr. Falk also received over 200 comments from stakeholders and the public um, that we incorporated into the plan um, where appropriate. So the bulk of the plan is the Regional Vision Zero Toolkit. It includes the regional high injury network, um, crash profiles broken up by area type, behavior profiles, and countermeasures. Um, I'll talk about the regional high injury network first. Um, the network was developed by identifying areas with the highest KSI crash density. KSI mean killed in serious injury crashes. I'm going to keep using that term. Um, we used KSI crashes from 2013 to 2017. Um, the network did end up being very large. So to hone in on two priorities areas even more, we decided to do a more detailed analysis analysis along the regional high injury network to identify critical corridors for each county. Um, we analyzed each county separately to regionally disperse the corridors. So for each county, the critical corridors identify the top 50% of KSI crash density along the regional high injury network. Um, so with the region being so large, it was obviously hard to see details for the for these areas on um, JPEGs or PDF maps. So um, Dr. Stogcraft, Dr. Cog's staff created an interactive map for local jurisdictions to use. So I just wanted to demonstrate that really quickly. Um, so when you first get in here, this disclaimer pops up that talks about what years of data were used, um, what the maps map is, and also links to the regional data catalog, which is where um, local jurisdictions can download the regional crash data and other important regional data sets. Um, so just real quick, um, the regional high injury network is in blue. The um, critical corridors in, are in orange and just kind of type in your jurisdiction. We'll just do little, Littleton as an example. And as you zoom in here, um, you can see different colors for the KSI crashes. So if you look over here to the right, we have people walking in blue, people biking in purple, and then all other killed and serious injury crashes in teal. Um, we also included other important data sets like bus stops, rail stations, um, the active transportation corridors, the short trip opportunity zones, and the pedestrian focus areas, which were um, priority areas that were identified in our active transportation plan. Um, if you click on these dots right here and go to show item details, um, it will give you more information on each lever, uh, on each um, layer. So this is the vulnerable populations layer, which is very similar to the equity index layer that Rolf was talking about. Um, we've identified um, populations over the regional average for Hispanic um, people in poverty, minority people over 65, um, disabled populations and zero um, car households. Um, if you go back to here, sorry. Um, if you click on this, since this is such an important layer, we actually made a filter for this layer. So if you wanted to look at um, vulnerable populations that overlap um, in five of those categories, you can click this and, sorry, I need to turn the layer on. 
Yep. So you can see this is all of the vulnerable. Whoop, not anymore because I don't have. Sorry. So you can you can kind of filter out what you need. So this is with all of the vulnerable populations listed. Um, if you click these off, you can you can narrow it down to just the five overlapping layers or the six overlapping layers. Um, so we're hoping that's going to be a, a very useful tool for our local jurisdictions. Um, some quick stats on crashes included in the regional Hydro network. Um, the Hydro network captures 75% of KSI crashes on just 9% of roadways in the Denver region. That includes local, um, also includes local neighborhood roads. The critical corridors capture 32% of KSI crashes on just 1.5% of roads in the Denver region. So um, my point here is if that we focus in on these 9% or 1.5% of identified roads, we can hopefully start to make more of an impact on reducing some of these serious injury crashes. Um, once we identified where these crashes were occurring, we wanted to further dissect the crashes to take a better look at why they were happening, um, figure out some of the mechanics and behaviors involved and look at the countermeasures needed to apply to reduce certain types of crashes. Um, the Dr. Cog region is very diverse. Crashes in rural areas are different than what's happening in downtown Denver. So we broke the region up into four different area types, um, urban, suburban, compact communities, rural and limited access highways. Um, those were identified using a variety of data resources in an attempt to reflect um, the different built environments in the Dr. Cog region. Um, the crash profiles and the crash behaviors identified three things within each area type. First being the crash profiles, which look into specific events and describe the most frequently occurring crash types. Um, these inform the infrastructure countermeasures. And then second, behavior profiles, which describe human behaviors that could be a factor in a crash. And then lastly, we identify countermeasures, which are strategies um, kind of recognize as best practices for reducing certain types of crashes. Um, real quick, this is an example of one of the crash profiles, the bicyclists involved crash profiles. Um, it includes more statistics on the profile, further explains what the crash type is, where it's occurring, how to find it in Dr. Cog's regional crash data, and some information, information we got from the public surveys. So taking action, this portion of the plan um, identifies objectives and action initiatives that the region needs to work towards um, a target of zero. There were six, uh, six objectives identified. Um, this is an example of objective one, to improve collaboration between allied agencies. Um, this is pretty much so how all the objectives are set up. They include action initiatives, sub-actions that better define the action initiatives, um, what agency are going to be involved in accomplishing the action initiative, what year it's gonna launch, and um, tracking performance measures. Um, so I wanted to talk about a few things we're doing to implement the action initiative since the plan's been adopted. Um, this is a huge one, the Safer Main Streets Initiative. Um, this initiative is a joint effort between Dr. Cog and CDOT to allocate $77 million of dollars to safety projects in the Denver metropolitan area. Um, the Safer Main Streets Initiative is to work towards transforming the way we use street spaces, making them safer and more accessible, especially considering the environments we're living in today with COVID-19, more people are out walking and biking and it's important they can do these activities on safe, accessible facilities. Um, so we're wanting projects for this initiative to focus primarily on pedestrians, cyclists, the, air, um, the elderly, and people with disabilities who are most dependent on having reliable um, urban street networks. Um, so just as a reminder, um, applications for this initiative are due August 19th. Um, so just a few more things we've been working on. Um, we've been working with FHWA to host safety workshops. We're hoping to do more of those in the future. Um, Dr. Cog's GIS team and CDOT are working to get faster crash data available for download. Um, we're currently organizing a regional Vision Zero working group. Um, we're hoping to have their first meeting at the end of this month. And we're strategizing for a public education campaign that will launch in 2021. And we'll be using the working group um, to, to direct and create ideas for that campaign. Um, and also we're kicking off the development of a regional Complete Streets Toolkit. Um, the kickoff meeting for that project is this Thursday, August 6th, um, and it's gonna provide local jurisdictions with more direction on um, safety design elements for multimodal facilities. So um, hopefully you can key into that meeting also. 
And that's all I got. I'm happy to take questions or um, we can do that during the question and answer session. Thank you, Beth. Um, thanks for sharing those resources as well, but we'll be sure to link to the map and other resource, resources you've shared in the same um, in the same web page that we link the recorded webinar to. Thank you. Okay, we have about 10 minutes for Q&A, so we'll open up to the audience. Um, as I mentioned, please drop your questions into the chat box. Um, we have one that I'll kick off with. Um, this is kind of directed to the group. Aside from engineering, what can we do or invest in to help address the risky behaviors that result in fatal crashes? I can take this one. This is Jill from the Denver Streets Partnership, and I know somebody had submitted a question um, when they registered about um, speeding in particular and the value of lowering speed limits versus engineering streets um, to reinforce safer speeds. And ultimately, it is street design that is going to be the biggest determinant of how fast people are driving on our city streets. Um, but there is some interesting uh, evidence from cities across the country like Boston and Seattle and Portland that have just across the board um, reduced speed limits, for example, reducing neighborhood speed limits from 25 miles an hour to 20 miles per hour, um, that simply changing the posted speed limit can, in fact, reduce serious crashes um, and injuries that are resulting. Um, and part of that, I think, is, you know, it's accompanied by a, a pretty widespread media campaign or education campaign to raise awareness of the dangers of speeding and the new speed limits. Um, and I think it's also a pretty powerful statement of what the community's values are, um, that we value human life and safety more so than the speed and convenience of driving. Um, and that statement from the top, I think, can help shift the culture overall towards thinking differently about how we behave on our streets and the, the value of human life on our streets and also helps justify subsequent street design changes that come down the pike. If you're designing a street for 20 miles per hour rather than 30 miles per hour, you're gonna do implement different street designs. So even though just changing the speed limit by itself isn't probably enough or isn't gonna have as big an impact as actually redesigning the streets, I think it's a very important low cost step um, that communities can take. Yeah, this is Rolf, and also just some other programmatic and policy changes, um, either working with uh, neighborhood organizations and or with the schools uh, in order to not only uh, inform, educate about traffic safety to youth who will soon be future uh, drivers and our existing roadway users independent of a car. Um, but, um, but yeah, so reaching children and then adults with uh, education and uh, the other areas, you know, some just different policies, either be um, how do we accommodate people, uh, all people in, in uh, construction zones and detours, having uh, different kinds of complete street guidelines. I know that kind of feeds into the infrastructure piece. Um, I guess, yeah, those, are, those would be a, a few of the other ideas and some compliance with some photo enforcement opportunities as well. It's definitely a, a multiple prong approach that usually gets the best uh, results in terms of compliance, engineering, in, uh, and uh, education, um, if you will. So, thanks. Yeah, this is Beth, just to add on that, um, we've been doing research on um, education campaigns since we're gonna be kicking one off in 2021. Um, just looking at like New York City City's Your Choice Matters campaign, there's multiple metrics that they've had in there, and, they, and, and it's just interesting to see how much public education in a campaign campaign such as that um, has made an effect on on some of the stats in the city. Okay, thank you guys. Um, 
Another question that just came in. I chair the question. I'm gonna, just going to read it word for word. I chair Transportation Solutions Arapahoe County, which represents people who can't, who don't slash can't drive, blind, um, I slash DD, and area ride providers. Our people are highly at risk walking. Do you know if Arapahoe County has uh, bought into this program, or do I need to campaign? I'm not sure. I mean, Arapahoe County is part of our board of directors. So obviously they voted to adopt Regional Vision Zero. So I, I think they are by and they participated in um, the stakeholder committee meeting. They're going to be participating in our regional complete streets toolkit. Um, so I think they are working towards it. I'm not sure exactly what the specifics are for that, um, but I can't find out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll share um, also some contact information if um, there's some follow-up items here as well. That would be great. Yeah. Um, I have sort of a comment here. Um, thanks for your response, Jill, regarding reducing speed limits. I agree redesigning streets is a key action towards Vision Zero. I'm a fan of lowering speed limits within a local jurisdiction. I think it begins, I think it begins to change driving herd behavior. For that comment. And Rolf, I have a one for you. Um, what is Dottie? Yes, thank you. The Department of Transportation and Infrastructure. It used to be Public Works, and the voters voted to change um, the, the title of the department to the Department of Transportation and Infrastructure. Great. Um, I think we've gotten through all the questions that we have so far. Um, I'll keep an eye out for any more, but we are just running up on about three minutes. So just kind of got reorganized on our slides here, but um, I'm going to put up the contact information for our speakers on your screen now. And if I did miss your question, um, we will have your contact information to um, reach out to you after the presentation. Okay, I have one more question here. What do a majority of speed studies actually show about the impact of artificially reducing speed limits? Can you repeat that one more time, please? Yeah, the question is, what do a majority of speed studies actually show about the impact of artificially reducing speed limits? Um, what do they mean by artificially? Um, let's see, I have a fault comment from uh, it says if okay sorry the clarification is if the design speed is 30 and you can reduce it to 20 what actually occurs yeah this is jill again um and i i honestly don't think there have been that many studies because there haven't been that many instances where cities have sort of blanket across the board said we are now reducing our speed limits from 30 minutes, 30 miles per hour to 20 miles per hour. Um, but the most comprehensive data was from when Boston did this a few years ago. Um, and it did in fact show even without changing any design of the streets, just the simple act of reducing the, the default or standard speed limit on the city streets did reduce the number of crashes um, and the uh, severity of those crashes as well. That was the most rigorous study that I'm aware of, and I think that's from the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety. Um, and then more anecdotal data from Seattle and Portland that have done similar sort of across the board changes, again, show a decrease in both crashes and severity of crashes. It's not huge, um, and I think, the data also shows that actually changing the street design is going to have a much bigger impact on crashes and severity of crashes, but the data does suggest it's not negligible just changing the speed limit. 
Yeah, I'd say that, that yeah, that Seattle um, recently put out a report. And in addition to um, lowering the speed limit, increasing the sign size and also the frequency of the signs, they had, it seemed like some decently compelling data about reducing uh, speeds regarding those uh, people going um, quite a few miles an hour over the speed limit. And uh, they linked it to uh, serious injuries as well. And I think that's online uh, available. So um, should be able to access it. Okay, great. Thank you. We're right up here at noon. So I'm going to say thank you so much to Beth, Jill, and Rolf for your time and um, knowledge. Thank you everybody for joining. Um, please consider filling out a short survey about today's webinar um, once you close your window. Um, have a great day. Thank you.